Welcome everybody. My name is John Michael Carter, the CEO of Chartspan. We're delighted to have you join us today for our brief webinar on the emergence of telehealth and chronic care management programs during COVID-19. I'm delighted to have as my guest today, Alan Kopik from Adminology Bay. Uh, Alan, you are the CEO of Adminology Bay and a long time healthcare guy. Perhaps a little bit about your uh, experience. You bet, uh, John. Uh, so, uh, John Michael, I, uh, I started Adminology Bay in 2017 after uh, 20 years or so as a senior leader of hospitals in Kentucky, particularly, having started three of our Kentucky hospitals uh, over the past 20 years. Um, uh, so I'm a hospital guy at heart, um, but along the way, I got to be able to be a part of a, of a startup for a fairly qualified health center. Uh, here in Kentucky, which has grown very large. I served as the board chair for that organization uh, for six years from 2008 to 2013. Um, so I, I love uh, uh, seeing teams grow to high performance and great results uh, and uh, wanted to step out of that role to, uh, to found my, my healthcare consulting company now. Um, we shorten it to ABAY, uh, so we call ourselves uh, ABAY, but our, our focus is on finding where innovation is happening that can change the life of physicians, uh, providers, and, and patients, and then uh, injecting that innovation into the healthcare delivery system. Well, your depth of experience is why we wanted to spend a few minutes with you today. And we really want to focus on um, what we're seeing, and really it's the overnight emergence of telehealth and chronic care management programs that provide remote level telemedicine services to patients emerging as the new way to communicate with patients. We are in strange times um, and we are certainly learning to adapt. A couple of the headlines that we wanted to review and kind of talk about as uh, practices think about how to utilize telehealth. One of the things that caught our attention, Alan, was the remarkable expansion that CMS made in allowing 85 additional E&M encounters to be covered under telehealth. Yeah, so so this is a this is huge, and it's been one of the biggest barriers uh, to full adoption of uh, remote care delivery. Um, even though we know virtual care is uh, more efficient, it's more convenient for the patients, more accessible for the patient. Um, we know that value-based approaches are, are where we're all headed. Um, so now payers, uh, particularly Medicare, and then I believe uh, uh, more of the commercial payers will begin to follow Medicare's lead. Uh, but then to include that in, in, is a part or a staple of their payment panels is just transformative, transformative for the, uh, for the landscape. Uh, yeah, delivery. We really encourage practice administrators and providers to make sure they take inventory of what the 85 codes are, because there's a lot that you can be utilizing via telehealth that you may not realize. It's on CMS's website. It's an easy Google search to find those codes. Um, but we encourage providers to take a look at those. The second um, headline that caught our attention, and this may be the most important one, Alan, really came in two pieces. And let's talk about the first one. Traditionally, telehealth has been paid less for an encounter than a face-to-face E&M encounter. That has now changed. Yeah, yeah, this is, uh, this is, this is another one of those transformational um, changes that, uh, that are going to, I think, uh, further assist in this movement toward delivery of virtual care um, uh, every, you know, in much greater numbers, uh, absolutely greater numbers. It goes to the efficiency, uh, but to, to but be able to have a, a, a payment um, that's, that's in line with a face-to-face -face visit is just gonna, it's gonna make it much more um, accessible and practical for provider organizations to fully adopt. And the second uh, headline that we saw here, and this is also important as you think about general supervision versus direct supervision, is that physicians can supervise their clinical staff using virtual technologies when appropriate instead of requiring in-person presence. So that will be important as well as it gives you more flexibility as a provider to administer uh, services. But the big headline, I think, for many of our providers and our practices is that you're gonna get paid the same for a telehealth visit as you traditionally do for an in-person visit. No doubt. Next thing that uh, I wanted to tackle here was something that's really still evolving and we want to make sure practices 
and providers are paying attention to this. We think it's going to begin to emerge next week. The FCC was given $200 million in last week's budget to appropriate towards adoption of telehealth programs. And it appears here that they're going to fund the costs that providers will incur for infrastructure, for software fees, for IT services fees associated with deploying your telehealth programs. There's a lot here we need to see and understand over the next couple of weeks. But you and I were talking, Alan, it kind of feels a little bit like those meaningful use days when they were trying to get you to adopt an EHR. Yeah, so over a period of time, we can see um, you know, a, 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 a Medicare solution to a, to a given or a, a recognized challenge or opp opportunity, if you wish. Um, uh, Medicare tends to follow the same path. Uh, they, they take the structure from a previous uh, solution um, and apply it to a, a new problem or new opportunity uh, and a new solution. And, uh, and so, yes, it just reminds us a lot of um, uh, the kind of approach they took with meaningful use back in the day uh, 15 years ago when we all knew we needed to move the patient's information, the, the diagnosis, treatment details, the documentation of care, et cetera, into an electronic world uh, rather than have it live in a paper world. Um, and, and the problem was then to, to get that to happen, to, to gain full adoption. And uh, so that, that, that was the birth of meaningful use and the, the money that Medicare uh, made available to practices to move into electronic. Alan, I had a conversation today with one of the country's uh, leading ACOs, and they said, get ready, this is the new normal. And, and you got to believe when you see a program like this where the government wants to, to provide infrastructure money for the deployment of telehealth services, they're not doing that for temporary use. You got to think that a lot of the changes we're seeing with telehealth are going to stick way after this pandemic is open or over, rather. Oh, absolutely! It's here to stay. Uh, I mean, it, it, we. I, I think that's clear. The table is being reset, and uh, and some providers, you know, had a head start. They had a jump. They 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 kind of knew this was the direction we were all going, and so they began to lay the groundwork. You know, maybe year two, three, four years ago. Uh, some providers were caught off guard, unfortunately, and I, and I think um, that we're going to see that this is here to stay. Um, how can we deliver care virtually uh, the most effective way possible? Um, the winner is going to be, I believe, in the end, the patient, uh, because the patient's going to have that convenience, uh, that 24-7, that 365 access uh, potentially for virtual services. Um, it's here to stay. There's no doubt. We can't go back. Agreed. Um, last headline here, it was uh, HRSA awards totaling $100 million from Health and Human Services. Now, these were for primarily FQHCs and RHCs, about 1,400 around the country. The average FQHC, RHC got about $70,000. This is about a week old now. Many of them are just finding out and then figuring out how they're going to deploy uh, those awards to help them with COVID-19. Uh, and one of the things that we found interesting is that the utilization of those awards can go for a chronic care management program, which of course provides remote telehealth and electronic support for patients with two or more chronic conditions. That's important as you think about becoming the front line for those patients who are the most at risk, who are the most vulnerable patients to COVID-19. Um, so that becomes important. And in fact, you know, you really think about the challenges, Alan, that, that not just FQHCs, but all RHCs face uh, and, and traditional practices as well. And it really comes in three areas. You've got your patients isolated. They're either ordered to stay at home or you don't frankly want them clogging up your, 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 your patient uh, waiting room. Right. And, and that hurts you because now you, you're seeing a decrease in the volume of your E&M encounters, and that means less revenue at a time that you're already strapped for cash flow. And then, of course, you've got to worry about your staff and, and patient safety. Many of the providers and practices that, that we know are in tough times right now. Uh, absolutely. It's all the more reason why uh, some of these uh, stimulus dollars that have been committed toward practices maybe to move us into a new direction um, as, as provider groups, you know, move us to a better place from a value versus volume standpoint. 
um, the dollars are, are kind of carrots. Uh, they're, they're saying, you know, here's some, here's some money. Now there's some behavior we want to influence along the way uh, for you to qualify for the money, but, um, but here's some money. And I'm telling you, it, that, that, uh, that alone could help um, sustain some organizations who have had this very abrupt, very unexpected uh, uh, drop in, in their, in their face-to-face -face encounters due to, uh, you know, this epidemic, uh, this, this pandemic, global pandemic. Um, That's a great point. When you think about how do I put a sustainable, predictable cash flow in front of me right now, one of the best ways to do that is a chronic care management program. Medicare may not be the highest margin payer, but they're certainly the best payer in the country. They'll pay within 10 to 14 days electronically. Um, and so I, I want to focus uh, in our remaining time of, about chronic care management programs and what we're seeing with data. We've got some great data just uh, fresh off the presses here that we want to share with everybody. Uh, six pieces of data. Now, this comes from Chartspan, and we certainly are, are the world's largest as far as enrolled patient population, uh, as far as a managed service chronic care management provider. And so what we did is we had uh, our analytics team go in and take a look at some of the data that's happening. We're seeing a 28% increase in patients calling into Chartspan. So those are the existing patients. And when they do call in, about three out of four or 76% are tackling COVID-19 related issues with us. And, and that's what our clinicians are doing. Um, this next statistic is dramatic. 70.1% enrollment of all eligible patients. Now remember, a majority of these patients have a copay, but right. nearly three out of four of them are agreeing and consenting to be in the program because they value this ability to have a chronic care management program that their provider sponsors and that their, their provider offers them. So that is, that's a really interesting statistic. We've never seen volumes that high. and We've never seen uh, that type of enrollment percentage. Um, the next one here is 98.1% screen. So this is also interesting. Our clinicians have developed COVID-19 screening protocols because the last thing we want is to clog up those patient rooms needlessly with patients who don't need to be there because there are sick patients who do need to be there. And so what's interesting is less than 2% of all the patients who called in or we spoke to with COVID-19 concerns actually needed an appointment. And that becomes really important as you think about safety and, and, and how you triage patients. 45% uh, increase in prescriptions and refills. Frankly, that's not a surprise, uh, given the fact that, that we're on the front lines uh, handling those requests for patients. And then I think this uh, statistic is really important. The average length of our calls with patients have increased by 12%. And frankly, we're spending a lot of time just addressing fear. These right. are the most vulnerable patients. They're scared and they want somebody to talk to. And we're seeing a significant increase in the time that we're spending with these patients as we tackle those issues uh, for those patients. So from the provider perspective, John Michael, I'll just tell you that to, to, to realize that the, the Chartspan team becomes an extension of, of my team. Um, and provides that support virtually for my patients uh, is just a remarkable thing, particularly when we find ourselves in this in this uh, this place that we never nobody could have envisioned uh, three months ago even uh, that we would be in this type of a, of an environment. One of the challenges that most practices find when you stand up a chronic care management program is there's a lot of obstacles you got to get over to, to stand one up. We thought a lot about how could we remove those obstacles and make it easy to stand up a program quickly. So we're proud to have launched last week our COVID-19 rapid response chronic care management program. What that does is we give you a commitment that upon gaining access to your EHR, we'll stand a program up for you in 24 hours. And we're going to waive you know, all the contractual things that can be problematic. There's not going to be a minimum patient panel size. We're not going to require a multi-year agreement. You can just go month to month. And we're not going to send our teams to your site. We're going to do all of the training and onboarding remotely. And we've worked real hard over the last few days to make sure we've got an excellent onboarding and training program that can be delivered virtually. Anybody that would like additional information, feel free to contact your regional vice president or send us an email at info at chartspan.com. 
Listen, Alan, we appreciate your time today. Thanks for joining us. John Michael, thank you. And thank you for uh, delivering such an amazing turnkey approach to a very, very important service on behalf of uh, Medicare, our providers, and our patients. We're grateful. Thank you. Thank you.